And we are live. Well, hello, everyone. Wow. Uh, welcome to Ask the Expert from GBH. Uh, today, we are going to be learning about um, what I consider my favorite sport, holiday baking, uh, with our expert baker, Sarah Belial, who is the head of culinary production at Union Square Donuts. I'm Stacey Buchanan. I'm a senior arts and culture producer at GBH and I'm also a, a baking enthusiast. And um, I'm thrilled that you've all decided to join us today. This is, this is a lot. Um, so before we get started, I would love to give a special thanks to our leadership circle and RLS members. Uh, we appreciate your continued and genu generous support, especially uh, during these crazy times. And, um, before we get started, I would also like to introduce the team behind the Purple Curtain. Um, they're going to be pulling the strings and connecting you, um, but you won't see or hear them. And uh, let's get started. My first colleague is Bailey. Hi, Bailey. Hi, thank you, Stacy. Welcome, everyone. So glad to have you here. Unlike us, you will not be able um, to hear or see you. We will not be able to hear or see you. Uh, we hope you enjoy this event and learn a lot about baking. Um, back to you, Stacy. Okay, thank you. And we will also have Ileana, who will be keeping an eye on the uh, Q&A tab. Hi, Ileana. Hi, Stacy. Thank you so much. As Stacy mentioned, I'll be hanging out in the Q&A tab. We want to hear all your questions, and you can ask your question by opening up the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Be sure to let us know where you're tuning in before you submit your question. And if you see a question you want to hear the answer to, you can vote for it by giving it the thumbs up. We also have closed captioning feature for this event. To turn on the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription options will pop up. We recommend that you select the subtitle one to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window will open up and you can see what the speaker is saying. Please bear in mind that closed captioning might be a little delayed. Thanks everyone and we hope you enjoy the event. Great, thanks Ileana. So uh, everyone, without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's expert, Sarah Belial. Sarah, uh, her baking journey began at the Culinary Institute of America, where she earned degrees in uh, baking and pastry arts and food service management. Um, her first job out of school was working at the world famous Magnolia Bakery in New York City. So jealous. Uh, for a number of years, you were there where you baked, uh, you cake decorated, uh, you managed the store before you made the move to Boston. Um, here, you've been working um, in quite a few places, including for Joanne Chang at Flower, where you were overseeing the training of the bakers and cake decorators. Um, and then when Magnolia decided to finally come to Boston, uh, you were fortunate enough to uh, run the shop as their general manager. Again, very jealous. Uh, in 2009, Sarah competed on the Food Network's Holiday Baking Championship and now is the head of culinary production at Union Square Donuts, where you have just died and gone to donut heaven. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. So I have to, before we get started, um, I would love to hear more about your experience on the Holiday Baking Championship. I mean, what was it like to participate on a show like that? That was the most incredible experience I've ever had in my entire life. It, you know, when you watch it on TV and you think, oh my gosh, how did these people think of this in two hours and do it in two hours? It's really like that. They say, make a cheesecake, put a sugar ice skating ring, ready, go. You know, it's the most pressure you've ever felt in your life, but it's also the most fun you've ever felt. <laughs> right. And I bet there are only just like a few cameras following you around as you're trying to like run through like a hectic maze of, of baking. Oh, for sure. You have, you know, like three camera people in front of you. You have one down right near your elbow so they can see everything you're doing right there. I must have elbowed that poor man in his head about 50 times per episode. <laughs> what was like the craziest, most hectic thing that like happened to you when you were on the show? Well, there was one episode where we had to make jelly rolls. Um, we had to make a um, an imprime. So it's like a jelly roll that has a design piped in it. And I got a little over ambitious and I wanted to make mine really fat and nice and big. But the key to those is to keep them nice and thin so they fold really well. So of course mine cracked and I'm, you know, sweating bullets. I'm like, oh my God, my jelly roll is cracked. I'm, you know, I can't go home. I don't want to go home. Oh my God, it was terrible. But I, but I made it through and I, I made it to the finale. So <laughs> you can conquer anything, <laughs> even right. a jelly roll. 
What was your favorite thing that you baked on the show? Ooh. Um, well, I feel like every fan favorite was this Florentine tart I made for the for the Hanukkah episode. Um, I always make these Florentine bars at the holidays. They have pistachios, um, almonds, a little orange zest, and dried cherries. And I, I just kind of make them as bars and give them out to friends as gifts. But I, you know, in a pinch, made it into a tart. And everybody loved it. And, you know, after the show, they were Instagramming me and saying, oh, my gosh, what's the recipe for this tart? I want to make the tart. So, you know, it was, it's wild. <laughs> <laughs> So you said you went all the way to the finale in the competition, right? Yes. Oh my gosh. Yep. Eight episodes all the way to the finale. And the finale was incredible. We had to make um, a Christmas morning brunch. We had to make three items for brunch that had eggnog, um, gingerbread, and cinnamon in there. And then the finale was a tiered cake that had 75% of it had to be covered in plaid. And when you cut into the cake, the cake itself, like the crumb of the cake, had to be plaid. It was, when they told us we had to make a plaid design in the cake, oh my God, how do you do that? So half of that episode, you know, I feel like all three of us were just sitting down, you know, drawing things out on paper and making this blueprint of how to make cakes, cut them, stack them, and, and make little rings so that when you cut into it, it really was plaid. It was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> it's the hardest thing I've ever done. <laughs> I mean, I've always been curious about like the behind the scenes on the those competition shows. It sounds like it sounds like it's all just real and and in real time. <laughs> oh my gosh, absolutely. And you know, you Jesse Palmer was the host of the show and you get all starstruck and then he's just the nicest guy. He's the most down to earth like normal person. <laughs> he's so sweet the whole time. Did you have a favorite judge? Ooh, well, I feel like coming from a cake background, I, you know, I wanted to impress Duff and, um, and you know, it's Duff, it's Duff. So I, of course I was so nervous anytime we had to do a cake challenge or whatever, but um, yeah, he was, he was great. And he gave really good criticism um, that I feel like I grew from as the competition went further. I mean, that, that was actually leads into what I was going to ask you next, which is like, what's the, what's the, the big thing that you took away from the whole experience, the big thing that you learned? Um, not only that, you can make hundreds of things at the holidays, you know, and there are these, these staple flavors at the holidays that no matter what you make, if you make a cake or, um, you know, some breakfast item or a cookie, you know, you can take these fun holiday flavors and make them into so many different things. Mm -hmm. And when you go to decorate, you know, it's ice skating, snowflakes, Christmas trees, dreidels, you know, there's so many things to choose from that. This, this is why it's the most wonderful time of the year because you can just bake everything. <laughs> do, you pers do you have a favorite like holiday flavor? Something like your go-to? Uh, well, I do love eggnog. Um, and at Union Square Donuts, we're working on um, our eggnog donut that's going to be coming next week. Um, and oh my God, I could drink eggnog every day of my life. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> I don't I feel like I don't hear that often that's that's really interesting actually I have a I have a holiday baking related question in regards to eggnog I was thinking about this just the other night when you're baking can you replace things like milk and cream with eggnog just cup for cup for the most part definitely um so actually on the show um, I wanted to make popovers as one of the Christmas morning items and I replaced my milk for eggnog, but the eggnog that we had was very thick. Um, so my popovers ended up being kind of dense. Um, so if something, if you do want to use eggnog, but it's a very thick eggnog, like it's homemade eggnog, um, you can cut it with a little milk to thin it out. Um, so as long as your consistency is good, you're, yeah, that's fine. And then you get that wonderful flavor too. Interesting. Um, so um, I think that in regards to the championship questions, we should go on. Um, what's your What's the first thing that you've ever baked for the holidays? Um, so my family has a, a Christmas cookie recipe that we do every year. And I remember, you know, being little and making these cookies with my mom and sister. And my mom would let me and my sister squish all the ingredients with our hands and in the bowls. 
Um, and you know, it's so much fun when you're little to do that and to roll out the cookies and cut them out. Um, and I've made this same cookie recipe every year my entire life. And it's so funny because, you know, going from when I was a little kid making it to now, you know, I feel like every year I try to outdo myself with the same recipe. Um, so I have, you know, a cookie cutter that's a little snow globe and I love to do, you know, more intricate piping and stuff, but it's fun taking one recipe and then doing it every year and seeing how it's different every year. So do you have a go-to um, a cookie dough base that you've, that you've built over time? Um, absolutely. So anytime I'm making a cookie, whether it's a cutout cookie or you want to add some flavoring in there, like graham cracker crumbs or um, a nut flour or something like that, um, I just learned a, a basic uh, one, two, three cookie dough. So uh, with baking, a lot of it is a ratio. So for cookie dough, I do one, two, three. So it's one part sugar two parts butter, three parts flour. Um, so, you know, if you wanna make a dozen cookies, you cut everything down, as long as it's one, two, three, you're good. Um, and with this recipe, you know, with the dry ingredients, you can take a portion of the flour out, put some cocoa powder or a nut flour, like I was saying, um, and same with the, with the fat, if you wanted to do a different thing than butter, but I recommend butter always. <laughs> um, but yeah, so just this basic cookie dough. And it's it's so good because you have that butter flavor. So it's that sugar cookie that you can put orange zest in and make it a little more festive. It's mm -hmm. just fantastic. Now with the with the two parts sugar, would you recommend, like, can you experiment in there with like white sugar and dark brown sugar and like mix yeah. it up there too? I mean, I know that, I feel like for years I've been looking for like the perfect cookie dough base. And every time I just add a little bit more of the dark brown sugar, I get like, a little bit closer to the consistency I'm trying to get. So I've always been curious, like how, how far can I take it? You know, can I go all dark brown sugar? Yeah, I mean, you definitely can. I think it, the only thing I would be a little more, I would, I would cut it with a little regular sugar too, just cause brown sugar has that molasses in there. Right. Um, so you might get a little more spread, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, dark brown sugar, you get that like nice warm flavor. Oh yeah, that'd be delicious. <laughs> I, just, I actually love the spread. I know everyone has like their favorite cookie texture. Yeah. I'm, a spread. I'm a spread. I love like the crunch. <laughs> anyway, thank you. That was awesome. Um, I see that we have quite a few questions coming in. Um, so why don't we go ahead and get to it? Sure. <laughs> um, my first question here. Oh, so Susan from Niagara Falls. Hi, Susan. Um, she's looking for advice for working with frozen puff pastry. Ooh, sure. So frozen puff pastry, the op, like the opportunities are endless. Um, if you're doing something like a Napoleon, you know, if you want to do something like that, um, where you have it as a sheet, I always put it on my baking sheet with parchment, and then I'll put another baking sheet on top. That way you don't have so many layers that it gets super duper big. You still have all those yummy buttery flavors, but they kind of stay where you want them to stay. They'll stay in that sheet that's easy to cut and easy to stack. Interesting. So I'm going to mess this name up, the name of the item, but um, Pagano would like to, uh, I make a patashu. Patashu? Am I saying? Yeah, patashu. <laughs> yep. Patashu for mini eclairs. Mm -hmm. um, I find that they come out beautifully puffed and brown, but sometimes deflate as they cool. I poke a small toothpick holes in them, but it doesn't always work. Do you have any other suggestions to help? So I find that whenever I have pad shoe that deflate a little bit, I'm always scared to overcook them. I always feel like I need to take them out when they have that nice golden brown shell. And I feel like you almost want to let it go a little longer and then they have more structure. So the longer you let them go and they take on that really nice, you know, brown color, um, they, they're more stable. So if you underbake them a little bit, then they get the little, you know, sogginess and they'll deflate a little bit. Awesome. Um, L. Kenny, uh, can we easily make glazed donuts or cider donuts at home? We don't have a lot of kitchen equipment, but those are their favorite. <laughs> they're delicious. Um, yeah, you know, you definitely can. If you have, um, you know, a small electric mixer, like a KitchenAid, um, you can probably do it by hand if you don't mind, you know, putting in the effort of, of kneading that dough. Um, but apple cider donuts would definitely be a little bit easier um, just because they're not yeasted. They would just have the baking powder to give them the little poof. 
Um, but yeah, you could definitely do this at home. And even, you know, I feel like people get really nervous to deep fry at home because they think they're going to have this really hot oil and they're going to have a lot of oil left over. And, you know, what do I do with this hot oil? Um, you know, as long as you have maybe like two to three inches of oil so that the donuts um, can, you know, submerge in there and not overcrowd them, you know, just cook a couple at a time. Um, and it's not so intimidating to have, you know, a giant stack pot full of oil. Um, and then if you have a thermometer, um, you know, just keep an eye and get that perfect 375. Um, and all of your, all of your deep fried dreams will come true. <laughs> There are many of those. <laughs> so Allison is asking, um, oh, a lot of my grandmother's recipes call for shortening. Mm -hmm. Should I use Crisco or is it okay to substitute butter? Um, so I would kind of say it depends on what you're making. You know, if you, if you're making your grandma's, you know, famous pie crust or something, maybe do half shortening, half butter, because butter will give you the flavor you want. Um, but shortening really does contribute to those flaky layers. Um, so whenever you're doing something flaky, like a pie crust, for example, keep your butter and your shortening as cold as you can. Like I always, you know, pop mine in the freezer or the fridge before I throw it in the oven, because you're usually going to, you know, start a pie off at 400 degrees. And so when cold fat, like cold butter hits a super hot oven, it creates steam. So the steam will create those layers. In, in your pie crust. Um, so yeah, you can definitely either substitute, you know, part sh shortening, part butter. Um, and I think as far as doing, you know, something with butter and then doing all shortening, for example, if you wanted to keep it vegan, um, I really, really like a lot of these vegan butters that are out there right now. Um, my sister is um, dairy-free and we love this earth balance butter, but I like the red box the best. It's the soy free. So it's very, very neutral. It doesn't have a, you know, like a lingering kind of plant taste at the end. Oh my God, it's fantastic. It makes beautiful pie crusts. Um, I literally replace it equal amounts for butter in all recipes and it's never let me down. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Great. <laughs> you mentioned with pie crust that you, you get everything as cold as possible when you're making it. I've noticed in a lot of cookie recipes, especially holiday cookie recipes, that the recipes will call for you to bring your ingredients to room temperature. Um, what's the benefit in that? I've never really understood that. Yes, Martha Stewart loves that. She loves to bring all her ingredients to room temperature. Um, so basically, if you think about it, um, I'm trying to think of an example, a good example. Um, a, a muffin or something. Um, if you have all of these cold ingredients and your batter is cold, when you put it in the oven, it needs to go from cold to room temperature and then room temperature to cook or to bake to whatever you want it to. Um, they say with, with keeping your ingredients room temperature, you just get a little more rise or a little more poof on your muffin or um, it's just a little faster to get to the result you want. Right. Um, but things like like a chocolate chip cookie, for example, I would actually put that in the oven cold because sometimes if your butter is too warm, it'll spread a little too much. Um, we were talking earlier about people who love the spread, love the spread, go for it. Um, but yeah, if you keep every, you know, cookies def definitely um, nice and cold before you put them in, they'll hold their shape a little better, especially with cutout mm -hmm. cookies, like the Christmas cookies I was talking about before. If you keep those, you know, nice and cold when they go in the oven, they'll, they'll hold that nice tight shape. So what I, another part of like cookie baking recipes, I also noticed that they do call for um, um, putting them in the refrigerator for a few hours before you bake, which you've just explained really well. But I'm wondering how long can you keep them in the refrigerator or the freezer? Like, can people start making their base, their cookie bases right now, putting them in the fridge and then like in a week or two, start making their cookies with it? Um, my, my general rule of thumb from working in kitchens and stuff is, you know, if you have a cookie base that has egg in it, for example, like a chocolate chip cookie, mm -hmm. um, because it has egg, I wouldn't push it more than a week. Um, just because if you crack an egg and keep it in the fridge, you know what I mean? Leftovers, you would keep like five to seven days. So anything with dairy, I would, I would keep about a week. Um, but a lot of great recipes, you can make the cookies or make a bar or, you know, something like that, and then freeze it after you've already baked it. 
Mm. Um, so sometimes, you know, if I have a lot of holiday gift baskets or stuff to do, um, I'll plan to do my recipes that I can then freeze and pull. Um, but definitely with cookie doughs, you could even scoop the cookie doughs or cook, cut the cookie doughs and freeze those. And that would be fine. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about preparation. I know. <laughs> I, I personally, I love the holiday baking. Like, like I said, it's a sport for me and I, I tend to like go a little overboard every year, but there is always a moment of just terror when I realize like how much I've set myself up to do I, I enjoy the process but there's just that moment right before where it's like did I did I line all this up right am I going to bake something too quick and then it's going to go stale and it's, it's like you you have to be a project manager for the yeah. whole experience <laughs> I always joke you know wherever um, with my staff I always joke that the holidays are like the Olympics of baking. You yeah. know, all year training and you know pushing yourself to your limits, and then you know the Olympics come, and that's your time to go as hard as you possibly can. <laughs> um, I couldn't agree more. It's 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 time. It's time. <laughs> all right, let's. Oh, here's a question from Shelly. Hi there. My name is Shelly, and I am 12 years old. You inspired me to learn to bake over the past year, but there are still a few things I can't figure out how to do. When I make frosting, it never turns out like it does on TV. It turns out all soupy instead of whipped like normal frosting and icing. Do you have any advice for that? Thanks, you're amazing. Oh, <laughs> thanks, Shelly. Um, yes, I have tons of icing, icing advice. Um, so kind of depending on what type of icing you wanna make, um, I like to, I like to make an American buttercream a lot of the time, um, that I'm doing a lot of technical decorating and stuff because it holds its shape really nicely. Mm -hmm. My advice with that would be to get your butter at room temperature mm -hmm. and then mix your butter up in your mixer with your hand mixer, um, before you add the powdered sugar and keep it nice and room temperature. Um, if it's a little, you know, if you pop the um, butter in the microwave to, to soften it a little bit and it gets kind of melty you know, stick it back in the fridge, um, harden it up again, and really keep that room temperature, and it'll be the consistency you want. Um, as far as making like a Swiss meringue buttercream or an Italian meringue buttercream, um, you know, a little fancier with the cooked sugar, um, it's all about the temperature. So whenever you cook that sugar, make sure that you're following to the temperature on your recipe. Um, I like to make, one of my go-to icing recipes um, is Martha Stewart. <laughs> And she does this Swiss meringue buttercream. And Swiss meringue is always the, the most stable. Um, so she gets the egg whites and the sugar, the granulated sugar, and puts it on a double boiler. So on your stove. And, you know, just with a little spatula moving it around so it, um, you know, warms up evenly. And her trick is you put your finger in the egg whites and swirl your finger around. And when it's, when it's hot enough that you want to take your finger out, and you kind of rub your fingers together and you don't feel any, any sugar, you're done. Because that means all of your sugar has melted and um, it's warm enough to be added into your mixer and it'll whip up really nicely. And again, just watch that butter and keep it room temperature when you add it in. So what about like cookie icing? Like, you know, the, the, li the liquid icing, that the spreadable icing? Um, this is one that I struggle with every year. And I like, is there it gets too runny. Like I can't, or it'll either get too thick too fast so that I can't design mm -hmm. or it'll get too runny and just kind of run off the side of the cookie. How, like, what would you, what are, what are the perfect ingredients to make like that perfect, like icing that you can just decorate with that won't like spread too quickly? Like, I, do you have that secret to life? <laughs> I do. And it's so funny that this question came up. I actually just had this conversation with my mom and aunt last week. They were making some cookies with my grandma. Um, so I love royal icing with, with, with decorated, you know, Christmas cookies like that because it dries hard um, and they really last a long time. So I can have, you know, a plate on the counter with saran wrap and, you know, me and my husband can go at it for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. um, but for my royal icing recipe, what I found to be the best is um, in your, your or your KitchenAid, you're an electric mixer, um, add powdered sugar. So as much icing as you want. You know, if you're making a lot, maybe do like a whole bag or half a bag. Mm -hmm. um, and then crack your egg whites in a separate bowl. And then while the mixer's on low with the paddle, not the whip, the paddle, 
Um, stream in your egg whites just until the sugar looks wet all over. Mm -hmm. And then bump your mixer up to like medium high speed for exactly seven minutes. Mm -hmm. Put a timer on, seven minutes, perfect. And if you want it a little stiffer so you can, um, you know, pipe a leaf on like a poinsettia, um, add a little more powdered sugar. Um, or if you want to dip all of your cookies first before you stiffen it up to pipe, um, mm -hmm. you can always add a little water. But yeah, that powdered sugar, egg whites for seven minutes, it's flawless. Awesome. I, I've never done it with the egg whites. I'm definitely going to have to try that this year. I've... Yeah. I feel like people get so intimidated by like going to Michael's and getting meringue powder and all that fancy stuff. You don't need that. Get yeah. powdered sugar and egg whites. <laughs> Speaking of egg whites, what is cream of tartar? What is it? So cream of tartar is tartaric acid. Um, so it's an acid. Okay. If you actually like just put a tiny whiny bit on your finger and then stick it on your tongue, it's, it's really acidic. Hmm. Um, I use it for our Christmas cookies. Um, we have a recipe that has powdered sugar and butter to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, and I add a little cream of tartar because it helps keep cookies very, very light. So if you're gonna bake them, you know how they take on like a golden brown kind of color? This will keep your cookies very, very light. Interesting. <laughs> well, what does it do um, when it's used in like a meringue? Does it, is it part of that coloring and the consistency? Um, so in a meringue or if you're making um, a caramel or something like that, mm -hmm. it helps to prevent crystallization. So okay. when you have sugar that you're cooking, you're technically melting it down and then you're telling the sugar how to reform again. Mm -hmm. um, so if I'm melting it down for a meringue, you know, by whipping it, I'm telling it to do that or to make bubbles. Um, but the cream of tartar will keep it from, you know, making hard little crystals on the side of your bowl. Yeah. Um, it'll keep everything nice and smooth. That's good to know. Okay. So Kitty um, is asking regarding baking as gifts for those who can't see in person this year. Any suggestions for baking items that can withstand the travel time and the handling of mailing? Sure, so th this is a great thing to bring up, especially with everything going on now. Um, I sent cookies to my grandma a couple weeks ago and I remember I made the cookies on Saturday and I went to UPS and I wanted to overnight them to her. And they said the overnight would technically not go out until Monday and it wouldn't get there until Wednesday. And I was like, well, that's not overnight. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so with the mail being what it is and you know, not knowing when anything's going to arrive, um, you know, there, I was thinking about some, some mail safe things um, that, are, that make great gifts that everybody loves. Mm -hmm. um, I really love candying pecans or candying any kind of nut really. Mm -hmm. um, and those last forever, you know, those last such a long time. Um, and it's kind of something that people can have on the counter or, you know, have on the coffee table and snack on throughout the holidays while they're watching, you know, Christmas movies. Um, so I really like to do candied nuts, um, caramels, making any sort of candy is always a really good option too, um, because it's not something like bread that'll go stale or, you know, a cookie that'll get too hard, um, any sort of candy. So um, we've been experimenting with some different caramels and stuff. Um, at the donut shop, we did a, a pumpkin caramel and then we tried a, a cranberry caramel, mm. so just like a soft caramel that, you know, we could put on a donut for like a little treat for people. Mm. Uh, but those are so cute too, because you can make a ton at a time and cut them up and, you know, wrap the little parchment papers and they just make the cutest gifts. Um, jellies and jams, those are always really fun. Um, a donut coming up that I'm so excited about. Um, we're going to make a plum jam. So it's going to be a sugar plum donut. Doesn't that sound fantastic? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so a little sneak peek. Um, but yeah, so like jams and jellies, you know, they're so easy to make and you can can them. And again, they last forever um, and they just make such great gifts. And then something like that people can enjoy for, you know, weeks. Right. Um, Linda's asking, when creaming butter and sugar, my mixture always seems to come out grainy instead of creamy. Mm -hmm. I have the butter at room temperature, so I don't understand why I'm having this issue. I think it would probably depend on the recipe you're using. Um, some recipes do that. They have more sugar than butter. 
Um, so they do get grainy like that. But I also think that when it comes to creaming butter and sugar, it's very dependent on what you're making. So if I'm making a chocolate chip cookie, for example, I always use that as the base. Um, you wanna cream your butter and your sugar just until you don't see any butter lumps, but then stop. Um, you don't wanna have any of the, the big, you know, little white chunks in there. If you over cream things, um, creaming is a way to aerate whatever you're making. So it pushes air into your product. So if you, you know, cream the heck out of your butter and sugar before you make chocolate chip cookies, they can get kind of spongy um, and have like a, a good amount of lift to them. Mm -hmm. um, but for a cake, when you want that, you want them to be fluffy and full of air and soft and pillowy. Um, that's when you really, really, really cream your butter and sugar together. Um, maybe to, to prevent it from being too grainy, maybe cream it more than you think you need to. Um, and always do it on like a medium high on your mixer. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, Kathleen is asking, how about substituting maple syrup in your sugar cookie recipe? Is there a ratio? Ooh, so the only tricky part about substituting, you know, syrup or honey, um, for sugar would be the added liquid. So, you know, maple syrup, whereas it is very, very sweet, does have, um, a lot of, you know, liquid or water in there, um, that could make it a little too runny. Um, if you wanted maple flavoring, you could probably add a little bit. You could make the dough normally with the with the butter and sugar and then add some maple syrup to it, just a little bit. Or they have some really good maple extracts out there too. So if you wanted to do an extract, you could do that. But a little goes a long way with the maple extract. Right. We learned that on the Holiday Baking Championship, let me tell you. They were, <laughs> they were like, calm down with the extracts. <laughs> <laughs> So Sue is wondering, is it better to refrigerate your cookie dough before making cutouts and baking? Um, I, think, I mean, either way, you could refrigerate it first. Um, I always refrigerate it after because when the dough, when you mix the dough and it's nice and soft, it's so much easier to roll. Um, and then you can cut and then you can refrigerate. And then there, you know, your butter is nice and cold, so it's ready to go in the oven. Um, some recipes, I'm trying to think of one that I use. I have a, a chocolate crinkle cookie recipe that has you make the dough and then refrigerate it for a really long time. Um, but that just helps the dough tighten up. Sometimes, you know, if it's an oil-based cookie, um, it needs that time to, to solidify and tighten up and stuff and have the, the flour absorb all that liquid. Right. Um, Samantha's wondering, in your, in your one, two, three cookie base, how many eggs do you put in there? Um, so if I'm going to do, if I do the one, two, three cookie base, I usually do, um, like a half a pound of sugar, a pound of butter, and then a pound and a half of flour. And I feel like I'm always so used to doing like a pound of butter at a time, which I feel like is it's a lot to, to normal people. Um, so you could always cut that down, but that's usually what I go off of. Um, and then I'll add one egg. So one egg, a pinch of salt, um, and I always like to jazz it up a little bit and put, you know, some lemon zest in there, or orange zest. Um, you can do a little orange zest and some clove and make it like nice and Christmassy. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Liz from Arlington. So what advice would you give to new bakers getting started in the baking world? Ooh, um, I would say, it's not as intimidating as it seems. You know, I feel like everybody thinks that baking is very daunting because it has to be so precise and exactly this and exactly that, or you're not gonna get what you want. There are so many things out there, um, so many recipes that are nice and easy and just show stoppers. You know, there are so many things out there that don't actually require that much, you know, precise measuring and sugar molecular breakdowns and stuff um, that can just be fantastic. And, you know, in the long run, we bake to make, to make people happy. You know, you make a cake to celebrate something. You make cookies to give to somebody so they feel better. Um, you know, baking can be this incredible art form that you never even knew was the outlet you were looking for to, to be artistic. Um, but it also, it just makes people happy, you know? <laughs> Who doesn't like baking? <laughs> or baked goods. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so I want to take a moment to thank everyone. We've got a ton of questions to get through here, which is exciting. But before we keep going, um, 
I would like to take a break and introduce everyone to another colleague of mine, uh, Jamie Reese. Uh, welcome, Jamie. Hi, thank you. And hello, audience at home. Thank you so much for spending some time with us while we ask today's expert, Sarah, about baking and just in time for the holidays. You know, viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to learn new baking tips and tricks or to simply be entertained for a while. If you feel GBH is worth watching, worth listening to, and worth supporting, then please consider making a donation. You know, just like all the desserts we've been talking about this afternoon, your support of GBH would be so sweet. So today, when you show your support uh, for WGBH, or that's GBH, um, by making a one-time donation of $60, or by giving $5 each month as a sustaining member, we'll say thank you by sending you this navy blue vintage WGBH tumbler as a special thank you gift. This tumbler is just what you need to keep your coffee, your tea, and your hot cocoa warm on a cold winter's day. Please visit wgbh.org slash support events to make a donation in any amount. Every dollar our donors give really makes a difference at WGBH and helps us continue to produce great virtual events like this one year round on a wide range of topics from baking to birding. So simply click on the link um, in the chat tab now, or you can text baking to 800-492-1111 using keyword baking to make a donation. That's again, 800-492-1111 or clicking on that link that you see in the chat tab. Thanks in advance for your support. And now back to more baking tips and tricks with Stacy and Sarah. Thanks so much, Jamie. Um, yeah, we really appreciate your support. And so just to reiterate what Jamie says, you can go to wgbh.org slash support events to uh, make a donation today. All right, let's get back to these questions, shall we, Sarah? Great. Okay, so Anne, hi there. I love making scones. I do too, Anne. Do you have any flavor suggestions for scones for the holidays? Um, absolutely. So on the show, um, at the finale, we had to make a Christmas morning brunch. Um, we had to make three items with gingerbread, eggnog, or cinnamon. And I chose to do my scones gingerbread. Um, so I made this you know, basic scone recipe. I added a little bit of molasses, um, some ground ginger, a little crystallized ginger, um, some warm spices and stuff in there. Um, but then I thought it was so cute to have a little gingerbread man cut out. So my scones were in the shape of little gingerbread men. Um, so I feel like, you know, you can do a basic drop scone or, you know, just cut your little triangles. But um, this was kind of fun to make it a, a little shape, which I think makes it so holiday. Um, so I really liked doing a gingerbread scone. But definitely as far as, um, you know, kind of a neutral fruit flavor, anything with cranberry, um, orange, ginger, all of that are just the best holiday flavors. Would you recommend things like candied fruits too? Oh yeah, absolutely. I feel like, you know, we all don't <laughs> gravitate towards the fruit cake naturally, but you know, a lot of those dried fruits and, and candied fruits just are fantastic in other things. That makes sense. Okay, this question's from Gail. This is a good one. When you make a holiday cookie tray, about how many different types of cookies do you make for it? Ooh, that's an excellent question. So <laughs> I guess it kind of depends on how ambitious you're feeling. I like to have at least four, but that's me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that way everybody's covered. You know, you can have one thing that's kind of more fruit forward, um, something kind of caramel or sugar cookie for the people that like, you know, just a, a nice sweet little treat. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to do something chocolate for all the chocolate lovers out there. Um, and it'll give you a different opportunity to have different colors going on, different decorations going on. Um, you know, don't, don't go crazy and try to do 15 different cookies or something for, for one Christmas. That's a, that's a lot for anybody. Um, but you know, a couple different kinds, it just covers your whole audience. Right. Caitlin is asking, uh, what are your favorite baking books in your library? 
And do you prefer classics or newer publications? Ooh, um, I find with me, when I find one recipe that I love, um, I usually trust all of the other ones in that book. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the King Arthur cookbook. Mm -hmm. um, at the donut shop, we use uh, King Arthur flour and they're just fantastic. And I've gone to the, the King Arthur, you know, factory in, in Norwich, Vermont and had the time of my life. It was like Disney World, mm -hmm. um, but that's a great cookbook. And they have, you know, a lot of, of basic things, you know, a pancake recipe and a waffle recipe, um, but then much more advanced things too, if you wanted to try breads or, um, you know, different specialized cookies and stuff like that. Um, it's, it's a huge book, so it really covers everything, mm -hmm. which is great. Um, I really like a lot of Martha Stewart stuff. Her cupcake book is fantastic. Um, her cookie book is really good too. It has a lot of holiday cookies um, and just basic cookies too, you know, for throughout the year. Um, what else do I like a lot? I also find that when I use a recipe um, that I really like out of a book, I have a little notebook that I write down my favorite, favorite, favorite recipes in. So I have all of them compiled into one place, which is really nice too. So, you know, you can have a full library of cookbooks, but, um, having just a little notebook in the kitchen that has, you know, your staples on there is fantastic. That's a great idea. Yeah. Helps you to like adapt, make your own recipes too, as you move forward. Right. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I feel like anytime I, I learn how to make something or, you know, I make something that I really like, it's just this inner competition to do it even better the next time. <laughs> Going back to those Olympics yeah. for next year. <laughs> so speaking of baking, this question's from uh, Jim in Connecticut. Um, he's going to be making a panettone bread next week. Oh, there you go. <laughs> He's looking for advice on what type of yeast to use, rising times, um, and how to have two, I do have two tall panettone pans, he says he's using. Yep. Um, as far as yeasts go, I found with a lot of the dry instant yeasts, I've always gotten the same results with a lot of them. Mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes you find a recipe um, that's very French that is, has the fresh yeast, Mm -hmm. Fresh yeast is um, basically, so basically the dry instant yeast is a little, you know, microorganism that's covered in this little shell that once you add it to your dough that has some liquid in it, you know, water or whatever, it dissolves the shell and then the yeast gets activated. Um, with the fresh yeast, it's already activated. It's ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, you know, kind of crumbly. It's like a, like a firm tofu kind of texture. Um, but it doesn't last that long in the fridge, you know, um, because, you know, they're live little microorganisms. Um, but I really like, um, as far as yeast go, I haven't found any differences between dry instant yeasts, mm -hmm. which, which is great. So feel free to, to use any of those. Um, as far as rise times, I would follow your recipe, but as far as having a double check, um, with, with donuts, for example, that we make every single day, um, when they're proofing and we let the donuts rise, a check to make sure that they're ready um, is, you know, obviously the size has increased, um, but we call it like a pillow test. So you poke, the, you poke the dough with your finger and if the dough stays in where you poked it, it's not ready yet. But if you poke it and it poofs back and is nice and soft and pillowy, then you're golden. Um, an indication that you overproofed your your panettone or overproofed your donut um, is yeast eats sugar, right? So any any sugar in your in your dough is what they feast on. So they eat all of the sugar and then they basically burp and make carbon dioxide. So all the little bubbles, which is how it gets bigger and bigger, um, and they make alcohol. So sometimes, you know, if you're, you're making some bread and you forget about it for a couple of hours and you go in the kitchen and you're like, oh, why does it smell like a bar in here? Why does it smell like beer? Um, it's because you've overproofed it. So all that yeast, you know, burped and burped and made way too much alcohol. So, you know, sometimes with panettone, it, it's a yeasty dough. So it's supposed to taste kind of yeasty and, um, you know, a little bit like that. Um, but an indication that it's a little too far is 
you know, you feel like you're, you're drinking a beer when you're eating a piece of bread. <laughs> I've done that. I did that quite a bit over the summer. It's yeah. <laughs> because the yeast love the hot temperature so yeah. that makes sense, you know the warmer they are the happier they are they're partying you know so so any any proofing in the summer you have to watch it like a hawk <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so holly's asking holly from marion um when working with meringue can you use confectioner sugar instead of uh, granulating sugar um i wouldn't I wouldn't kind of depends on what again depends on what you're trying to make so you're trying to make um you know like the little meringues that you dry out as like a candy for people to eat mm -hmm. um i would use a french meringue for that uh so just sh granulated sugar and egg whites so you would have your egg whites mixing in your mixer and whipping up and then you slowly stream in the sugar and it gets that nice fluffy white um kind of consistency mm -hmm. a french meringue you would always want to want to bake or dry or something to cook it because it has the raw egg in it. Mm -hmm. um, whereas the, you know, the Italian meringue, if you were making, um, you know, an Italian meringue buttercream, or if you were making French macaroons, um, that, that sugar that you're warming up is so hot that it does cook the egg. So when you add that in there and it makes the meringue, it cooks the egg to over 135 and then it's safe to eat. Okay. Um, uh, what's your favorite part of baking? Oh, my favorite part of baking. Yeah. Well, I want to say eating it, but, um, <laughs> that's what I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, I mean, I really, ever since I was little, I've been very artsy and I really like to, you know, do arts and crafts and, and paint things and make things. Um, so I love that that's something you can do with food. It's like painting, but with food you know, or creating art, but with a whole different medium. Um, so I really like the, the artistic outlet. I really kind of find that baking is very stress relieving. You know, if I'm having a busy day or I'm, or I'm sad, I mean, how many times have we, you know, been in a pickle or been in a sad time and been like, oh, I'm going to bake something that'll make everybody feel better. You know, baking is just one of those incredible things that just turns everybody's day around. You know, if, you're heading into the to the office for a, a four hour meeting, but your boss brings donuts, you're gonna have a good meeting. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, Mary, Mary's asking, so I know you said the baking championship was done in real time, but did you know the identity of any of the items you had to bake ahead of time? No, it is exactly like it looks on TV. It is, it's us standing there in front of the judges. And then, you know, Jesse says, okay, bakers, your secret ingredient is cranberry sauce. And you just drop, you know, you're, what am I going to do with this? It really is incredible, incredible TV because you have to think on your toes and you have to constantly be able to adapt um, and, you know, change your mind on a dime. So it's, you know, thank goodness. I feel like you don't realize how much you know and you know how good you are at, at fixing things that are broken or you know making things look smooth that are not um until you're you're put in these high pressure situations but you know it's you just realize this whole other thing that you had going on that you didn't even know yeah <laughs> it's, it is it is truly a um a high pressured competition um but you know that's why they're that's why the stakes are so high and that's why you know the the audition process and the narrowing down of contestants, it's so, um, you know, it's brutal because it's, you know, pushing you to your limit for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, so Terry is asking, can you freeze cookie dough whole before you divide it up or scoop the cookies? Divide it up, you scoop the cookies, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, I would scoop the cookies. Um, I would scoop them just because if you freeze it and then, you know, bring it back up to room temperature to scoop it, um, anytime you're messing with the liquid in something, I mean, for the most part, if it's butter and egg, it's, it's fine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if something has a lot of cream in it or, um, you know, not so many stable liquid ingredients, it gets a little weird if you thaw and freeze and thaw and freeze. Um, so I would always recommend making your dough and scooping them 
into the portion that you would put it in the oven and then freezing it. So, you know, a lot of the times I'll make chocolate chip cookie dough, you know, I'll make a huge batch. I'll, you know, shape all the cookies and put them in the freezer. And then, you know, if we have people coming over, just throw a couple in the oven and then it's like, oh, here's some scratch chocolate chip cookies that I just whipped up for you to come over, you know? That's the secret, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then people always want to come to your house. Right. <laughs> If we go from regular size cupcakes or muffins to make mini ones, how do we keep from burning them? Is there a good rule of thumb on shortening the time? Oh, um, yes, definitely shorten the time. Um, a lot of the time, I mean, I know this sounds so bizarre, but in culinary school, they don't tell you any times. They don't tell you, you know, these cupcakes will bake in 22 minutes. All my chefs say, when it's done, it's done. So you've, learn to know when things are done, not by a timer, but just how it looks and how it feels. Everything I pull out of the oven, I always touch it because I feel like I've you know, been trained to do that. So as far as, you know, mini muffins or mini cupcakes, for example, use your same batter that you would use for regular size. Um, you know, obviously scoop less into the little minis, but um, I would kind of do maybe like five minute or 10 minute increments mm -hmm. and then just take a look at them, you know, pop your oven open, have a look. Um, have they risen all the way? Do they look wet in the center, but kind of dry and poofy on the outside? Then you would know to do more time. Mm -hmm. um, and same thing with the proofing. If you push the top of the muffin and it springs back, then it's good. Um, if you push it and it stays down, it's not done. Um, same with a mini cupcake. You know, cake is great for that. It, it'll, it'll always fluff back when it's done. Um, you can always do a toothpick test, you know, to stick the little toothpick in there. Um, if it comes out with some wet dough, put it in there for a couple more minutes. Um, and then if it comes out clean, you're golden. Yeah, I just, I watch everything and I touch everything constantly. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, Carolyn is asking, uh, generally we shouldn't eat uncooked eggs. So how can the uncooked egg whites and icing be safe? Oh, excellent question. Yeah. I'm about to get Bill Nye the science guy on you right now. Um, <laughs> so sugar is hygroscopic, meaning that it pulls moisture out of things. Mm -hmm. So when you make a royal icing, like I was saying before with the powdered sugar and the egg whites that dries hard, it's technically being cooked because it's drying. So that liquid, any moisture or wetness or liquid is where bacteria grows, but because it dries, it eliminates that moisture and then it's cooked. Um, but a good rule of thumb is like, you know, with the, with the Italian meringue buttercream, um, you know, if you're cooking it to softball stage or like a 240 degree sugar, when you add it to the egg whites, it'll always make your egg whites higher than 135. Um, and 135 is, is when it would kill the bacteria and make it safe. Um, Rhonda's asking, what's the best type of sponge cake to use for a, oh, a Yule log? What, bouche de Noël? A bouche de Noël, yeah. A bouche de Noël, yeah, a Yule log. Um, so what's the best type of sponge cake to use? And also, how do I prevent it from cracking when I roll it up? Uh, Rhonda, you and me both, that was my kryptonite on the show. What I'm going to tell you is what I found out that Duff told me, keep it thin. You're going to want to put more batter in than it says. Like it'll have a little leftover and you'll be like, oh, let me put it in there and it'll be nice and fluffy. Don't do it. Don't do it. Put exactly the amount it says. Um, and when you take the cake out of the oven, you let it cool for like a couple seconds. And then if you put a dish towel, like a, you know, like a clean regular dish towel on top of the cake and roll it over the towel and let it cool like that, mm -hmm. let it cool all the way because then it'll definitely crack. Let it cool just till it kind of keeps that shape. And then you can unroll the towel, but it kind of knows that swirl that it's going to do. So you put your cream in and then it'll roll back up for you. That's a great cheat. Yeah. <laughs> I learned that before the holiday baking championship. Yeah. Um, but yeah, those are definitely tricky. Mm -hmm. um, as far as, as doing a sponge cake for that, um, any, any sponge recipe uh, would work. You know, definitely find a, a jelly roll or a Yule log um, 
recipe for that to follow. Um, but just remember with sponge cakes, because you're using this foaming egg method, so you're, you're making um, your egg whites foamy and either like a pad of bomb with the egg yolks also, um, it's a time sensitive thing. So when you make that batter, remember that there are all these tiny little fragile bubbles that are holding air in there. So do it as fast as you can and get it in the oven as fast as you can. Okay. Um, Sometimes with, sometimes with regular cakes, people, um, you know, kind of banging on your counter to get out the big bubbles. Don't do that with a sponge. Get it in the oven because you want all those bubbles. Right. You want it to be nice and, and fluffy. So what is your favorite thing to bake during the holidays? Ooh, my favorite thing to bake during the holidays. Um, I do really like to do cutout cookies because I think it's, you know, it's so much fun to sit there and to decorate everything and make everything so beautiful. Um, and really now, I mean, they're above and beyond with decorations. There's edible glitter, you know, mm -hmm. and of course I put edible glitter on all my Christmas things. Um, but I also always make pralines at Christmas. Um, that turned into a thing. I made them one Christmas just on a whim. I was like, oh, this sounds yummy. Mm -hmm. um, and now my family loves them. They're like, oh, Sarah, are you coming? Do you have the pralines? Are you bringing the pralines? And my, my mom and dad are in Florida now. So I always have to fly to Florida for Christmas. Um, and it's basically like, don't you get on that airplane unless you have pralines in your hands. <laughs> so, um, but those are so much fun because it's something different too. You know, it's um, like a little confection that, you know, has nuts and has all those holiday flavors, but it's a little sweeter than a cookie. <laughs> right, that makes sense. So um, it looks like we are getting close to time. Um, before we start to wrap things up, though, um, I want to bring Jamie back one more time, if that's okay. And there she is. Hi, Jamie. Here I am. Hi. And hello, everybody again at home. You know, this event has really put a smile on my face. And that goes along with, you know, just another reminder to all of you at home that contributions from viewers like you support GBH's ongoing efforts to develop new content to make your day a little brighter, which is exactly what this event is doing for me. And I'm also thinking about what I'm gonna bake next. Um, so you, yes, you at home can make more events like Ask the Expert possible. Just visit wgbh.org slash support events to make a $60 donation all at once or in $5 monthly installments. And we would be so happy to send you this tumbler as an appreciation gift. It's perfect for tea time or any time. Keeps your drinks hot in the winter and cold in the summer. Just click that chat link to be brought to our site or text BAKING to 800-492-1111. That's 800-492-1111. You know, audience support is a key ingredient to making GBH programs you know, on TV, on the radio, and now virtually possible. So wishing you all a happy holiday season and happy baking. Thanks, Jamie. Um, it looks like we, um, it looks like we are out of time right now. And we have so many questions that we didn't get to. Um, Sarah, is there is there a place online where the audience can connect with you? Yes, absolutely. If you have more questions, by all means, reach out. Um, you can either message me on Instagram, my Instagram is S Wallace, W A L L A C E one. Um, so S Wallace one, um, or you can email me right at union square donuts. So Sarah at union square donuts.com. And that's Sarah with an H. <laughs> and, and can you, is there a little bit of information you can share with us about what, um, what you're up to for the holidays at union square donuts? Yes. Oh my God. So we just dropped our Hanukkah menu. So all of our Sufgen Yots are on the menu now. Um, we have a homemade strawberry jelly filled donut that's um, tossed in snow sugar. So that like nice sweet powdered sugar. Um, we did an orange marmalade that's tossed in a clove scented sugar. Um, we have the halva pistachio, um, which is fantastic. It has some honey, cardamom, um, that beautiful tahini flavor and the pistachios. Um, and then we're also doing a Nutella cream. So it's oh, no. beautiful, I know, <laughs> Nutella pastry cream um, with dark chocolate and then toasted salted hazelnuts on top. So uh, 
absolutely fantastic. Um, we're also working on a babka um, that's made with donut dough. So it'll be this beautiful loaf of, of bread, but made of donut dough um, with, with dark chocolate in between the layers, all swirled up. Yeah, Hanukkah is going to be delicious this year. <laughs> I can't, I don't know if you can hear or see the mouth watering going on right now, but <laughs> that's so great. Thank you so much. Oh, and also um, the pistachio Florentine tart that you were talking about earlier. Um, so everyone, Sarah provided us with that recipe this morning um, and thank you so much for doing that. Um, the recipe is available on wgbh.org slash holiday recipes. I will be making that for sure this year. Yes, enjoy, it's fantastic. And thank you so much uh, for joining us today and uh, teaching us all the ins and outs and tricks of, uh, of a successful holiday baking year. And um, I also wanna thank everyone who joined us um, in the audience. This has been wonderful and um, we'll see you again soon. Thank Bye. you.